All right, welcome back. We're going to start with part two of this lecture. So we're going to talk a little bit more about similarities. Um, the palette size for each of these is going to be important. We're also going to talk about the basilar portion of the occipital bone, the occipital condyloids, the larynx location, and how they reconstructed the SVT. Um, so we're going to start with the palette size. The palette sizes can be seen here. We're going to talk about the newborn palette, um, in which the ramus is, um, sorry, that the length is less than the width, so it's 2.1 to 2.6 centimeters across, or roughly. And then the Neanderthal palette is actually about equal in size, both length and width. It's going to be about 6.2 is the determined average. And then in man, the length is going to be longer than the width is, so it's about 5.1 and 4.1 respectively. Um, this is just important because it shows the shape of the mouth. Um, so, oh, whoops, skipped ahead too soon. So we're just going to talk about this dental arch here. Um, the dental arch is U-shaped in most of these. Uh, it's roughly U-shaped throughout. Um, all right. So you can see the palettes here as well, and this is a under the underside of the skull, so it looks a bit strange. Um, so picture two here is going to show the turgoid process of the sphenoid bone, which is relatively short in the newborn. Um, the posterior process of the turgoid, posterior border of the turgoid process of the lateral lamina is inclined away from the vertical plane in both the newborn and Neanderthal, and not so much in the, hum uh, the adult man. And the styloid process is also inclined away from the vertical. Um, vertical. So here we're just going to show a brief um, examination of the way that they reconstructed the SAT. So once again, we have newborn, Neanderthal, and adult man in that order. You can see that the shape of the newborn is very L-shaped, it's kind of wide and very long, and you can see it's kind of similar, more similar to the Neanderthal man, opposed to the human, where it's much longer and shorter, or thinner, than it is in both Neanderthal and adult man, or newborn. And that's very important, because it's going to show... Well, what it will show is that the Neanderthal and newborn have a much similar speech capability of their SVT. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about a comparison of casts. So in order to do this, they created um, some casts, silicon casts, and the they showed that newborn and Neanderthals had very similar pungid characteristics. Um, however, there's some differences. In the in Neanderthal, the nasal and the oral cavities are much larger than man's, which we saw before. That was why it was much thicker and wider at the top than it was for man. Um, so it's very similar in shape to the newborn, and the opening of the larynx into the pharynx is related to the position of the hyoid. The hyoid for both the Neanderthal and newborn is very high up. Um, in the newborn, the hyoid changes as adults uh, as they enter adulthood, so that's why their voices drop, uh, men's voices drop. So the posterior third of the tongue presses down on the hy hyoid, and it slips back. So instead of having the um, so the tongue becomes kind of U-shaped or sloped. Um, <clears throat> So it shifts from a more horizontal position to a more vertical position, and the epiglottis shifts away from the soft palate. Um, you would think this is great because it allows you to talk, but it actually is going to cause people to choke, which is why we choke. Um, Neanderthals didn't have nearly the same 
issue. You can see here, once again, that the shape of the casts from the newborn and the Neanderthal are very similar. They have the same high forward arch and thin back. Um, underneath, the shape is quite similar. The openings are much more alike than in the man, where you can see how the posterior third of the tongue in the man shifts backwards. And that's so when you look at the man's, it's got this very high, broad arch above. And then if you look down, it's got this between the t tongue is much further back. Uh, that's that part up there in the back. Um, so you can see, once again, newborn and Neanderthal are very similar. So now we're going to just talk about how the SVT causes physical and um, the SVT's limits and how physical and mental limits on speech are determined. Um, the SVT limits, so because this was quite kind of limited because they weren't able to determine the source of the control of the SVT, so they modeled the risk reconstruction of it, and they tried to determine if the Neanderthal was able to produce a full range of human sound. Um, when they couldn't come up with the an actual figure, they used the best figure that they could calculate. Um, so when they plotted the super super laryngeal area function, they used this computer analog to chart it, and they used these cylind cylindrical sections uh, with a fixed area. The junctions between the cylinders stand for the constraints and continuity of pressure and volume velocity. And the uh, computer calculated the low three lowest formant frequencies that they could have produced. Um, so the they also created this neutral baseline, which was measured in 0.5 centimeter intervals. That was just as a way to determine how well Neanderthals could speak. Uh, speak. So here we have a depiction of the airway. Once again, you can see the same, a very similar shape for Neanderthal and newborn. At the same time, you can see that the they're very long, elongated. Um, but for newborn or adult men, they're much longer or taller than they are wide. Um, and so then this next picture is just going to talk a little, show you a little bit about the area functions. Um, these are just diagrams that depict the typical functions for the Neanderthal for the three lowest formant frequencies. Um, Alright, so now that we have an idea of what the functionality or was, they proved that Neanderthals couldn't produce a full range of speech. They were lab limited to labial and dental consonants, so that's anything that's made with the lips, the teeth, a little bit, and the tongue. They didn't have the same control over their lang or superlangeal area tract. Um, so they also might lack the ability to produce nasal and non-nasal distinctions. Uh, you can see with the Neanderthal, if you go back to this picture here, they have this very high, wide space above their mouth, uh, above what the where the tongue would rest. Um, in humans, you can see that the nose nasal cavity is very distinct, but in Neanderthals, they didn't have it the same distinction. Um, so, that is going to, might cause, uh, the lack of ability. They're not really sure because this is all very hypothetical and theoretical. Um, the Neanderthal posterior pharyngeal cavity acts as a parallel resonator, and the parallel resonator introduces an energy minima into an acoustic spectrum and widens the bandwidth of formants, and it could, um, alter the way their speeches and the it, it might even create the energy minima as being not audible to the human ear. So what they did determine, however, is that their speech speech capabilities would be limited to I, E, U, A, E, and a reduced schwa vowel. The schwa vowel is the vowel in the word brought, the O, U sound there. 
Um, and they would also be able to produce the following consonants, D, B, S, Z, and F. Um, Alright, so we're going to look at these charts. This is a chart of human, uh, human ca speech capabilities. All the dots are the different tests that they ran. And they have data from adult children, adults and children, as well as men and uh, male, men, men and women, or boys and girls for each. Um, this shows the range of capability for human speech, and the loops are called 90% of this range. So you can see there, there's little vowels in each. Um, they're not really important, but they just show that humans are capable of creating all these different vowel sounds. And next, they have the same exact letters, which are clear to see here. Um, and this is the frequencies that the computer charted for the Neanderthal. The human loops have been overlaid, and it shows a visibly reduced reduction uh, of speech capability. So the Neanderthal cap is incapable of producing the letters A, E, I, U, or S and the consonants like G and K. Um, and then here is just the area functions for human vowels. It shows how the SVT reacts to produce the different sounds that are available. Um, Alright, so we're just even actually going to go into a third little video now. Um, just to finish this up, we're going to talk a little bit more later on about the speech apparatus, the brain and language, and then we're just going to talk about some future studies that we could do, as well as some of the things that we will be, do we will be doing tomorrow. Alright, that's it for this video. Please tune in to part three.